Things went on like this until the last day of the tennis tournament when Brody encountered the boy Wonder from California who played him to a standstill. As they walked off the court, he put his hand on his shoulder. Hand of the victorious is a heavy load to carry. And that night, in spite of his aching weariness, Brody lay awake long after Carolyn was sound asleep. At last, he got up and crept with infinite caution into the living room where, I'm sorry to say, he drank the contents of Humphrey's bottle. He decided it might be better to do something about the taste. He found some cocktail bitters and added several drops to the water which he'd already put in the file. Then he put it back on the mantelpiece and over the mantelpiece there was a mirror. Alan took a long look in this mirror and he smiled. Now it happened that in Caroline's play there was another part, supposedly her sister, and the actress playing his part walked out in a fit of temper. A new girl had to be found in a hurry, and the producer nominated the niece of a friend of his. And this new girl was a smash hit. Carolyn went home that night, the sound of this new applause ringing in her ears, and found the place empty. Now, the emptiness of one's own home at midnight can seem like an injury, and Carolyn took it as an injury. She looked at the largest of the framed photographs of Alan and felt somehow dissatisfied with his smile. It's not mature, she thought. She looked in the mirror and tried, and it wasn't easy, a smile of her own. And this she found even less satisfactory. I might as well face it, said this veteran of 27. I'm old. She stood and watched her reflection, and in the stillness and silence of the apartment, she could feel and almost hear the remorseful erasures of time. Moment after moment, particles of skin wore away, hair follicles broke, splintered, and decayed like the roots of dead trees. All those little tubes and lines of thread-like chains in the inner organs were silted up like doomed rivers. And the glands, the all-important glands, were choking and clogging and falling apart. She thought her marriage was falling apart, and Alan would be gone, and life would be gone. So she drank the contents of the little bottle. She was very calm as she went to the bathroom and refilled the little bottle with water and added a little quinine to give it a bitter taste. And when Alan came home, she overwhelmed him with tenderness, feeling, of course, as if she'd betrayed him. She was going to desert him and go away into an endless springtime where he could never follow her. So time, which was the cause of all this trouble, went on, and both Caroline and Alan, secure in imperishable youth, saw in the others, through a magnifying glass, more and more of the hastening signs of decay. Alan began to feel that Caroline, at the very least, should have provided herself with a younger sister, and one night he dropped into the theater and discovered that, in a manner of speaking, she had done so. And all this time, Humphrey, being trained, to await patiently the outcome of his scientific experiments. Waited patiently. And then Caroline came to him. Humphrey. Humphrey. I've left Alan. These things happen? It's your fault. Oh? Well, maybe not yours exactly, but it was that horrible stuff you gave us. Oh, Humphrey. I'm the lowest kind of hypocrite and traitor. All of which means, I suppose, that you're the one that took the stuff. What did he say when you told him? He doesn't know. I filled the thing up with water and put some quinine in it. Tell me, why did you put quinine in it? To give it that bitter taste. I see. Well? Oh, I've tried so hard to love him more than ever to make up for it, but... You just can't make up for a thing like that. Besides... Yes? You can't help watching a person who's aging in front of your eyes. And when you watch someone like that, you notice all sorts of things wrong with him. And it's all my fault, of course, because I just don't love him anymore. Maybe I never did. You've changed your mind about wanting to be young forever? Well, don't you? Not if I can't ever love anyone again. There's always yourself, of course. That's mean, Humphrey. 
mean and cruel. Even if it's true. Well, it is lonely being like this. But then that's the price we pay for our little immortality. You and me and, of course, old Dingleberg. We're animals of a new species. There's us and the rest of the world. Of course, I used to think we were like that for quite a different reason. Oh, Humphrey, if we only... Oh, but I'm so unworthy. I let you down and now I've let him down. The first was a mistake. It can be fixed. But not the second. You mean letting him down? We can't put that right. No, we can't live with that. Oh, I think so. You say the stuff tasted bitter. You're quite sure about that, I suppose. No. Oh, no, it was very bitter. You see, that has far-reaching implications. I used nothing but ordinary salt in the water. Orson Welles will be back in just a moment. Orchid and a man-eating tiger. Well, have you ever heard of a man-eating tiger orchid? No? Well, we're going to show you one on this program next week. The carnivorous posy is featured in something called Green Thoughts, which is a sort of spook story with a seasoning of giggles. I hope you enjoy it. Till then, I remain, as always, obediently yours.